Ladies and gentlemen, Gene DiNapoli. Okay. Oh, is it working now, Anthony? There we go. My my mic was on silent. Welcome, everybody, to Monday Night Show, reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli. Happy belated Valentine's Day to everybody, guys and girls. Hope you had a wonderful, wonderful day and that your loved one uh, treated you with a little love and kindness yesterday. Tonight, we are celebrating our 24th episode. And when I started this five months ago, I said, I'm going to do this for three or four weeks and then I'm going to get out of it. But you know what? I am having such a blast as I hope you guys are. And by our numbers every week going up, shares and likes and some of these shows reaching thousands of people, uh, it seems that you do enjoy our shows and we will continue them. Right now, we want to say hello to our sponsor of the week, Anthony. We're talking about Cruise Planners Dream Destination Travel. They specialize in individual and group travel, whether it's a land trip or sea. They have the latest offers and sales. And because of their large inventory of quality vendors, they can get you the best deal possible. So here's their special offer right now. Any Norwegian cruise of seven nights or longer, you get a balcony or a higher cabin room you will get a $250 matched deposit. That means if you put up $250, they match $250. So your deposit goes from $250 to $500. If you do three or more cabins, the deal is extended to $500, and then they're $500. So to hear the deals, go to their website, www.sundrenchedcruises.com. Dot com. That's sundrenchedcruises.com. Okay, Ann? Great. We want to let you know that sometimes people don't stay for the whole show. And we normally mention our next week's guest at the end of the show. But I think next week's guest deserves two mentions, which we're going to do from now on. Uh, We have, which I am so tickled pink, the last surviving member of the original rock and roll explosion group, Bill Haley in the comments. We have the sax man, Joey D'Ambrosio, will be here with us next Monday. And Joey's going to tell us stories uh, that only he knows and everybody else in the original group has now passed on. So if you want to hear about the inception and the genesis of rock and roll, tune in next week, February 22nd, 7 o'clock, and watch Joey D'Ambrosio from Bill Haley in the comments. Thank you, Anthony. I need a sip of water because I went out, I did a gig yesterday for Valentine's, and I had too many martinis. And I'm not a martini drinker, so my throat is very dry. So I got to ask you guys and girls a question. Uh, How many people grew up with doo-wop music out there? Okay, I know by a lot of our listeners and viewers that you did, but I am not a doo-wopper growing up. I was born in 1966, so my love of doo-wop came later on. And I remember telling my mother one day, maybe I was 9 or 10 years old, and I heard the Belmonts who were from my neighborhood, do a song. And I said to my mother, I said, Mom, do you hear that song? That song is great. And my mother said to me, it's great, Gene, but you never heard it by a group called the Rob Roys. And I never forget, the next day I got on the bus, I took it to Parkchester, and it was a place called uh, Harmony Records. And I went inside with my dollar fifty, and I said, "I need a record called Tell Me Why." 
And the guy looked at me, he said, I'm going to give you the version that I sell to everybody. And he gave me this record. And I went home and I put it on my, my record player and I went ape shit. I went nuts because this, ladies and gentlemen, this was doo-wop from the Bronx at his best. And we are now going to welcome our guest of the week from a great group called the Rob Roy's. Say hello to Mr. Norman Fox. Come on in, Norman. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. yeah. Hello there, Mr. Fox. Hello. Nice to be with you, Gene. Oh, it's so good to have you here. You know, my mother, who's no longer with us, made sure that I learned uh, all different versions of songs. And when she told me about your group, I maybe 10 years old, went to Parkchester, got the song, wore it out, had to go back to Parkchester, buy it again. And then my mother only let me play it once a day. But you are Bronx royalty. I don't know oh, if you know that's that. Sweet. Thank you, you so Bronx much. Royalty. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Well, well, I only speak the truth. Uh, we spoke for a few minutes before. You were born in the great borough of the Bronx. And uh, why don't you take us back to the you know early days growing up? Because you, you came from... Uh, uh, well, I lived, I lived, I lived in Parkchester, where you got the record, and um, I lived there until I was about uh, twelve years old. It was just a wonderful area, many, many friends, and um, then my family moved to Stamford, Connecticut, and we only stayed there for a couple of years, uh, and then I moved back to the Bronx. We moved to the Riverdale section, where again. I had many, many friends, and uh, but I'm a Bronx boy. I went to Dewood Clinton High School, and that's where the group started. Um, we started listening to Alan Freed's show on WINS radio, and I fell in love with the music. It intoxicated me, and so I wanted to emulate all of the great groups that I heard on that show. And um, so I followed the Cleftones and uh, many, many others. Um, Chuck Berry, the Everly Brothers, all of these people were people that were that were that he played on his show. And uh, then again, he also had he also had shows at the Brooklyn Paramount Theater where where these where these groups were would appear live. And so we saw the Cadillacs, the El Dorados, uh, many, many more wonderful groups. And then we started to emulate these groups uh, because we were so in love with the music. And that's how we basically got started. Um, you know, we, we found some guys. We started to harmonize in the bathroom. It had a great echo. And... Um, we finally interviewed people and got the harmony together and sang and worked it out. And we performed at the assemblies. And that's how the group got started. Right. But let me go back. Uh, I guess you this question. Was anybody in your family music uh, inclined? Not that I can remember. Um, my uncle told me that he used to sing on the radio, but he had such a deep, hoarse voice that I didn't know where the hell that came from. So I'm not sure that anybody really um, was musically inclined in my family. Right. But my father, my father used to sing me Irish lullabies. Now he was Jewish, but he sang me Irish lullabies. And that's the one thing I remember. Well, let me ask you this. I, I know you're of Jewish uh, uh, religion. What is your ethnicity? Uh, my, on my, on my, Mother's side, um, my grandmother came from Romania. Wow. On, on my father's side, they came from the Russian-Polish border. Wow. It was a little mixed up between the world wars, so sometimes it was on the Russian side and sometimes it was on the Polish side, but that's where they came from. Right. Now, did you live in a building in Parkchester or did you have, come from a house? 
I lived in a building in Parkchester, and I, it's 1505 Archer Road. I can still remember it. I can't remember what I ate for breakfast this morning, but that <laughs> I can remember. So I, I was born on Archer and Taylor. Right. I lived in an apartment building when I was first born as well. So your apartment building must have been heavily uh, Jewish, in, in I, would, you know, I would say that you know it was mixed, but there was there were a lot of Jews in the building. Right now, that leads me to my point, which I'm going to bring up. Uh, how did you wind up with the first or one of the first interracial groups in 1955? How did that happen? How did you not just wind up five Jewish boys? Well, it's a great question. Um, we wanted to get a perfect sound. Uh, we were looking for the sounds that emulated all of the black groups that came out of the original R&B music. Mm. <clears throat> the, the El Dorados, um, all of the, the, the great black groups. And those are the sounds that we wanted to get. So when we interviewed boys in school, we didn't interview our own kind. We, we interviewed black guys so that we could come up with the kind of sound that we wanted to get. Right. Wow. And, and it worked out that way with having five members uh, of uh, different ethnicities. I, I think it worked out beautifully because the blending of the different voices, I thought those Rob Roy's, those original Rob Roy's, had the best harmony that I ever heard. And let's mention the original Rob Roy's. And if I don't say their name right, please correct me. On baritone was 17-year-old Robert Thera. That's correct. Right. Another 17-year-old bass singer was a guy named Marshall Heflin. Ba Marshall Helfand. Helfand. And we, called him, we called him Buzzy. You called him for his haircut? Or? No, just that was his name, Buzzy. Okay. Uh, again... Uh, 16-year-old first tenor, Bob Trotman. Yes, Bob Trotman, great, great guy, really high voice. It's just wonderful. And at 16, once again, second tenor, Andre Lilly. That's correct. So That's cool. who uh, who did the auditions? If if uh, you were you were the originator of the group, so you held the auditions with anybody else? I was one of the originators of the group. Uh, Buzzy Helfan and Bob Thera, we, were, we all formed the group together. And we had many, many uh, people who tried out for the group. And we went through uh, a lot of different, uh, different people before we came to the final group that did the recordings. We just had to get the meld of the correct voices uh, and uh, Bob Thera and Buzzy were very sophisticated in the way that they went about this, and they uh, they they really have the great responsibility for it. I thought. Right, right. And um, are are any of the original members still with us to date? To my knowledge, they're all still with us. They don't sing, mm. but they're all still with us. Well, that's that's wonderful. Uh, I know right now because of COVID and the virus, all live shows have stopped. But I'm going to tell you this, Mr. Fox. Uh, when I hit Lotto on Wednesday for $70 million, I'm going to reunite the original Rob Roy's on a show. We're counting on it, Gene. You, you got I'm, it. Absolutely. I'm putting it to you in front of your audience. You got it. And my audience knows I'm a man of my word. I will do <laughs> it. So let's put one, uh, one rumor to rest. The name came from the drink, right? Absolutely. Why? Why not the martinis? Why not the grasshoppers? Why a Rob Roy? Because when we 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 would we were all around the age where we we were finished, we were 13 and getting bar mitzvah. These were all all the Jewish guys, and I was going to all of these bar mitzvahs. And at that point, there were two drinks that were put out on the tables when you first entered the reception. And one was a Rob Roy, and the other one was, uh, I don't remember, maybe a martini. Okay. But the Rob Roy, the name, 
stuck to me. I thought it was very sexy and very romantic, and I really liked it a lot. So when the record company, we were originally, before we started, uh, we'd be, be, when we first started and before we got the record contract, we were known as the Velvet Tones. And when we went to the record company they and they signed us, they said, not a good name. There's too many tone groups out there, and you got to come up and change the name. So we started to think, and we started to think, and the Rob Roy came into my head, and that's how it became the Rob Roy's. They accepted it. They liked it. That's how we got the name. So you actually got uh, an audition under the Velvet Tone moniker, but then they changed your name. Is that how I'm reading into it? That's correct. And and I'll tell you, there's an interesting story about the audition because that was also in the Bronx at around in the East Bronx. I don't know if you remember the Third Avenue L. Sure. But at 167th Street and Third Avenue under the L, just to the left, there was a small record shop called Buddy's Record Shop. And one of the guys, Bob Trotman, one of the black guys in the group, he had a connection with Buddy. And so he mentioned us to Buddy, and he said, I have this group and so forth and so on. Would you, I'd like you to audition us to see if there's anything that we can do. And we went down. We couldn't all even get into the record shop. We had to, um, we had to get in sideways. And, um, so we got in, and that's how we started. We got our first audition, and Buddy called the guys from Backbeat Records, and that's how we uh, we we got the audition for the uh, for the record company. Oh, the, this record comp the record store was so small that you well, could two, just of, two of us were out in the street, oh and my that's, God. that's how we had to sing for the for the guy who owned the shop. Buddy Dunk was his name. Buddy Dunk, right. And you got signed to uh, Backbeat, uh, a Peacock, which was a subsidiary of Backbeat, correct? It was, uh, it was uh, the Backbeat Records was a subsidiary of Peacock Duke. It was a Duke organization. Okay. And they were out of Houston, Texas. And their claim to fame was that they had, they, they were a black record company and they had all of the guys on the Chick Chitlin Circus. Everybody was on that label. Even, mm. uh, even, yeah, I mean, I remember many, many people were on that label. And uh, we were the first integrated group, and he was interested in, in, in signing us for that. Now, Tina, that was Turner, Tina Turner was on that label. What was that? Ike and Tina Turner were on that label. That's when she was anime Bullock, right? That's correct. Wow. Now, if I remember, that was a... a a gospel type label, right? That's correct. That's correct. So, so they decided they wanted a foray into the rock and roll and sign you guys. And the first song you did for them, what what it was your anthem. Tell me why. That's right. So yes, we're gonna play true. a little bit of tell me why right now for our viewers. Okay. Video number one. Wow. Talk, talk about energetic. That was, that was a video uh, that came out of uh, what we did for um, the, um, the PBS. The show that we, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, right now we're going to put up a picture, Norman. Uh, this is uh, Anthony, picture number one. This is uh, you and the guys. Is this your first uh, promo picture? Yeah, there, this was one promo picture. This is, and there were there was another one where we're stacked up and down. But these were the first two pictures. Wow. Uh, and on uh, Anthony, put up picture number three. They used the same picture for uh, Lonely Boy as well. Right. Right. Uh, 
which I don't well, understand. This, this is this is this is actually probably a, a, a bootleg record that that I don't know anything about. So mm -hmm. they they grab these pictures and that's how they do it. Okay, so uh, now you got tell me why, and it, it's creating a buzz. Uh, how long after you recorded Tell Me Why did you go back in and record your next uh, batch of songs? We did four songs in the, in the session. Mm -hmm. So um, the the next song that they released was a song called Dance Girl Dance. That was also on Backbeat. And then That's when when we 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 got upset with Backbeat because uh, they didn't pay us any royalties. Um, we decided to leave and um, we had a manager and we were able to get a contract with the Capitol Records, which was a major, major thing for us. Sure. So, that's, a, that's a big, that's a big label. And um, we, we recorded four songs for Capitol Records. And the first song that we did was Pizza Pie. And the second song that we did was Dream Girl. Right. Now, although uh, Tell Me Why is your signature song, I have to tell you, as an Italian and an Elvis fan, uh, my favorite song by you is Pizza Pie, because right in the middle of it, you throw out a couple of Wella Wellas, which is an <laughs> Elvis type uh, thing. So uh, we're going to play a little bit, Anthony, uh, Pizza Pie. <laughs> I love that song. It's a great song. That, that was a great video because we did that in Barcelona. Right. And the guys who were backing us up with the Velvet Candles. And uh, that was so much fun. We really had a ball there. Uh, how long were you, were you there? Uh, we were there for about a week. About a week? Yeah. Uh, was it just you? Uh, yeah. It was just me and, and the Velvet Candles. Uh, and you were received excellent there. Oh yeah, we really had a we had a great time. It, you know, it was it's such an interesting thing about doing doing these shows overseas because the audience. I mean, there was nobody in the audience over forty years old, mm. and, and so people are really recognizing that kind of music over there. It's just a wonderful thing. We have the poster from that show. Anthony, put up picture number five, please. Right. So did, did you do all shows in the same location? Yeah, we did it. We, we were there twice. We went back uh, We went back a couple of years later, and we did it in another location. And uh, then we were supposed to go back and do uh, another festival, uh, but that didn't work out. So, But we've been there a couple of times. It's a lot of fun to do. Do it over there. They really appreciate the music, and it was a it was a great show. Absolutely, you know that goes the same with uh, Elvis Presley overseas is more revered there than he is in America. So the doo music that we have here, uh, they love, and their music we love. Uh, now, Pizza Pie, you know, I wouldn't have expected uh, your group to do that. I would have expected, you know, Dion being Italian and you know, Vito Pacone being Italian and Joey D. So how did the idea for, for Pizza Pie come about? Uh, I used to go, I had a friend of mine that and we used to go out on Saturday night and we had, this was way before they had pizza pie, pizza parlors on every corner, a pizza <laughs> store on every corner. They You could only get good pizza in decent Italian restaurants. And so every Saturday night, it was a treat for me when I lived in the, in the West Bronx in, in, in Riverdale, uh, I had a good friend of mine and we used to go out, whether we went to the movies or whether we had dates or whether we, wherever the hell we went, we wound up at this, at our favorite Italian restaurant in Riverdale and we split 
one of these huge pizzas. It was one of my favorite, favorite things to eat. And I was a very plump guy in those days, and I could really knock those pizzas off. So I fell in love with it. And I, you know, when I was writing music, I said, geez, it'd be a great subject to write a song about. And that's how Pizza Pie came about. I think it's great. And, and uh, I think if anybody, maybe DiGiorno or uh, somebody else should pick that up and use it in their commercials. That's what I think. I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. So now uh, between 56 and 58, uh, you did a lot of live performances, a lot of live performances. Uh, who were some of the acts? I mean, did you ever do the Brooklyn Fox? No. Paramount? No, we never did them. We never so did. We, we, we actually never did. We did a lot of performances. I did a lot of, a lot of record hops with Jocko. And I remember record hop uh, that we did at Sunnyside Gardens, where they used to have the fights. Mm. And um, when this is before video, and I sounded black on the record, so nobody knew the difference. And we used to get played on all of the black radio stations, and we never really got played that much on the white radio stations. Because they nobody knew that we were a mixed race group, and we didn't, you know, uh, we didn't do it. We never advertised it. So when we did the uh, Sunnyside Garden show, the um, the audience was all black, and when I came out, um, they were shocked that 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 we that should it should be a, a white guy who's leading this group, and one kid got very, very incensed. He was in the front row, and he must have been a, a great fan of the Rob Roy's, but he got very, very incensed that I was white, and he got crazy. They had to take me out of there under guard. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. That's, uh, 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 you know, it's funny how you had an interracial group <laughs> And yet one of the members of the audience was being a little bit uh, unappreciative uh, of the whole music scene. Well, it goes both ways, doesn't yeah, it? It, it does. Know. It does. You know, I was going to bring this up later, uh, Norman, but one of our viewers wrote that you look fabulous. Is this a right time to say, can you tell our viewers how young you are? Yes, I, I, I can. I'm going to be 81 in two weeks on February 28th. 81 years young, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this. In two weeks on the 28th, you I don't know if it's the Bronx or if that you got L.A. water in you. You look fabulous. Let me tell you, the water is lousy out here. It's strictly the Bronx water. <laughs> So what made you move to L.A.? Well, my wife passed away uh, about 13 years ago. And um, I had no reason. I've been wanting to leave New York. Uh, I lived in Manhattan most of my life. I mean, I was brought up in the Bronx, but I lived in Manhattan most of my life. And I was married uh, for 43 years. And... Um, I had always wanted, I, there was a time that I just wanted to get away from New York and live a little bit of a, a quieter lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I said, you know, I, I didn't want to be there anymore. It had nothing to do with feelings that I had about New York. I actually love it and I, I miss it now because I usually go back there two or three times a year. And I was telling my son last night that I absolutely miss New York terribly. Uh, but I wanted to get out, and um, I have a daughter and a couple of grandchildren out here in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. so I decided to move out here, and uh, I'm glad I did. It's 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 a different lifestyle. I like it a lot. Um, I met uh, uh, another woman out here that I married, and uh, I'm I'm really very happy here. It's it's great climate, and uh, 
And I still come back and I do shows in New York and I love it, uh, but I'm glad I live here. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And we want to uh, wish you the best out there. And, and, and espe especially, Gene, in this cold weather, yeah. you know, it's cold out here, but they're cold out here at 70 degrees. Uh, yeah, I feel for you. I feel for you. <laughs> so let me ask something. When you were under the uh, that gospel uh, record company, uh, uh, which was, um, uh, what was Back the name of it? Backbeat. Backbeat. Uh, they didn't market you the right way. Uh, were you able to get out of your contract with them due to that reasoning? Well, we thought we were able to, and that's why we signed with Capital. But apparently this agent that I had was a friend of mine's uncle, and um, he told me we were out, that we could sign the contract. And um, so we signed, and uh, the minute that they put out Pizza Pie and Dream Girl, uh, they came running. Apparently all this guy wanted, this guy in Texas wanted, was money. And I'm 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 upset that capital wouldn't pay it, and because that was really uh, the end of the road, um, they should have paid it. We would have had a big hit. They would have been successful, and I would have been very successful. But it didn't happen that way, and that's the way things happen in life. Right, right, and that's a great attitude to 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 have uh, looking forward. But when you went to capital, you recorded under another name uh you recorded under the temptations no 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 that's a, that's, that's a fallacy that's not true it's but i've fallacy. heard it before no i've heard it before but it's not correct it's not correct we 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 signed and we recorded under norman fox and the rob royce okay so that's another room where we put to rest here correct. Okay. great great uh yeah we got one of our friends uh sonny maxson who's a wonderful friend and a, a great photographer. And he said, uh, you would have never written pizza pie if you started in LA because LA pizza sucks. <laughs> he happens to be correct. It can, nothing compares to New York pizza. That's no, absolutely the truth. It doesn't. It doesn't. So tell us, uh, now you said you had uh, dream girl was yeah. out as well. Uh, did you realize when you recorded that that was going to be such a uh, iconic love song? Did you know? No, not at all. Um, Dream Girl was a beautiful song, and I I loved it. And I wrote it. I wrote it on the subway. I wrote it on the A train. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was coming back from school, and I was probably tired, and I was drowsy and I was rocking to the music and I was listening to the rhythm of the tracks and the wheel on the tracks and I got into it and I got this tune in my head and I got to tell you I wrote Dream Girl on that train it didn't take me more than 15 20 minutes of course I didn't have all the lyrics in place but I had the basic formula for the song and it was a, it was a great song. I I adore the song, and so does everybody else. But the popularity of Dream Girl did not really happen until very very late. In in it started probably in the nineties, and uh, went into when we started doing the revival shows. That's when the popularity of Dream Girl really started to move. It's the most requested song that we have. And um, I have to tell you about an instance. I did a song, I did a show in Philadelphia uh, for uh, Jerry Blavitt. And um, he, Jerry's a disc jockey in Philly and, and he has a very big audience and he's, he's been doing this for, for many, many years. And he, when we came in to do the show, normally we do Tell Me Why is the last song that we do. Mm. And, he said to me, listen, tell me why is not your main song here in Philadelphia. Everybody loves Dream Girl. You got to do that as your, your main song, your encore song. And so that's really what happened. And it happened everywhere over the years where Dream Girl became the major song of, for our group. Wow. 
that, and uh, thanks to Jerry, the, the the Gita with the heater. Right. Thank, thanks for him for bringing that to your attention. And right now, for our viewers and listeners, there, uh, occult favorite, Anthony, Dream Girl. Dream Girl. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, there's your wife right behind you. There oh, she is. There she is. Ah, uh, you didn't think we saw you. <laughs> and what is her name? Karen. Hi, Karen. Karen, uh, say hello. Hi. He <laughs> says Karen, hello. Is Karen from California? She is. She's oh, uh, she's originally from Iowa. When she came, moved to California when she was nine. Wow. What part of Iowa? Davenport. I, I play in Davenport <laughs> really? at, the Cole, at the Cole Ballroom in Quad City. I do. Uh, and speaking of Dav uh, Iowa, <laughs> just last week we celebrated, <coughs> excuse me, remembered the tragic uh, night, February 3rd, that took three of our uh, emerging and what would have been some of our greatest rock and roll stars, of course, the Big Bopper, J.P. Richardson, Richie Valens, and Buddy Holly. Um, let me ask you something. Touching on Buddy Holly, uh, growing up in that era and seeing Buddy Holly uh, emerge, where do you think Buddy Holly would have went had he survived, Norman? I think that Buddy Holly would have been the biggest star that we've ever seen. He was there. He would have, he would, I think he would have eclipsed Elvis, in my opinion. That's how great he was. Well, as a writer, uh, you're probably, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'd like to think that Elvis still would have done okay for himself. Because, well, I don't blame you because yeah. you're an Elvis man. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, do you remember that, that night when uh, it was announced that they had perished? Norman, do you remember I that? I do. I do remember it, and um, I, as a matter of fact, I put out a video a few weeks ago because it was the 50th anniversary of American Pie, mm. which is a tribute to that night. And um, yeah, I do. I remember it very well. It was a shock for everybody, but the song "American Pie" by Don McLean um, just it, it's such a an intuitive song about that tragedy and about how someone feels about the music. And I can feel it deep down in my bones. And so I sing it in my act. I sing American Pie. And I have a great, great reverence for that night. Wow. That's, uh, that's news to us. Because uh, the few times that I have seen you, Norman, has been on uh, compilation shows where you only got to do three or four songs. So I, yeah. we, we never experienced you doing American Pie, but uh, that's going to be another thing. We're going to reunite the original Rob Royce, <laughs> and then you're going to have to do American Pie for us. Right. Absolutely. A question from one of our viewers. Uh, what was one of your favorite venues to perform at? You know, I have a I have a, a a poster on my wall in my room here, and um, it's a poster of Radio City. In uh, we did the twentieth anniversary of CBS FM, and that was one of the greatest. We did two nights, and it was with some great people. If you want me to, I can read the people who were on that show. We would love that. Was that a Frankie, uh, Tony DeLauro production? It certainly was. And Frankie yeah. Lons. Yes. I'd love to hear the groups. We okay. all love to hear the groups. I'm going to sure. read it for you. I'm going to read it for you now. Please do. Shirley Alston Reeves. 
the Dixie Cups, the Times, the Jive Five, the Dandeliers, Norman Fox and the Rob Roys, the Capris, the Classics, Larry Chance and the Earls, Lenny Coco and the Chimes, Vito Pacone and the Elegance, Darlene Love, Arlene Smith, the Cleftones, the Limelights, Felix Cavallari, Ronnie Spector. Those were the groups that were there. I think we might have heard a few of them. Uh, <laughs> that's that's unbelievable. You couldn't pay for a show these days like that. No, you couldn't afford to. Right. Uh, right. Let me ask you this, Norman. You were one of the few groups uh, that actually started out with the name of the lead singer with the group. Yeah. Normally, I would be the uh, uh, the Rob Roy's, and then later on, Norman Fox. Was that a group decision? Uh, no, it was a record company decision. Um, we were originally we never we never had that when we originally started. It was just the group. Mm. But it was a record company decision that they wanted to put my name out front. Did they ever approach you to become a solo artist? No, they never did. We didn't stay there that long. My record career, my <laughs> record career was not very successful. So I and I I never got paid any royalties except, of course, with Capital when we cut the things. We we they were they were a legitimate company, but we never got anything from from the other companies. What a shame. Um, what a shame. And and it's because of what you people, meaning the early rock and rolls, what you went through, which led to today's stars and the stars of the 70s and to get paid because of the injustices that were done to you guys in the 50s and the early 60s. Abs absolutely correct. That's that's exactly what happened. Well, I, I, I can't say... Uh, I'm happy that you didn't get paid, but we're very happy that you did what you did uh, at the beginning. Uh, you might not have made a lot of money, but we hope that you got a lot of pleasure out of the business. Well, I got a, I got a lot of pleasure out of the business, and I'm getting more pleasure out of the business now than I've ever gotten before. Um. I've learned over the years um, to enjoy the music to the point, all music, not only doo-wop, not only rock and roll, but every facet of music is, is part of my heart. My son is a classical conductor. He's a major leaguer and he conducts large, large orchestras and large choruses. Wow. And and he, he has taught me a lot about classical music. And so I enjoy that. I enjoy country and Western. I enjoy music from different parts of the world. And I'm enjoying it more. I got to tell you, Gene, I'm enjoying it more now than I have ever enjoyed it in my life. It is my passion. Well, uh, we, we know it's your passion. Um, what is your son's name? The Stephen, the maestro. Fox. Stephen Fox, yeah. Maestro Stephen Fox. It's Maestro Stephen Fox. He he is the principal conductor and um, director of music at the National Cathedral in Washington D.C. Wow. And also the, the head, uh, also the same in the Clarion Music Society in in New York City. Fabulous. And this, of course, was fueled by your career choice. By your choice in music? Well, it's got to be in his genes because right. when he came to me and he said to me, I want music, and he was offered all kinds of money on Wall Street, and I said to him, you go where you love because you got to do it every day, and that's what he did, and um, he's, he's doing great. He's just great. Well, we're going to check him out on YouTube and follow the career of Maestro uh, Stephen Fox as well. But, you know, you, you made a remark before that your music career uh, didn't last too long. I have a short list here uh, of songs that you recorded, uh, and some of them really took me by surprise. Now, 
I'm going to mention the song and you tell me if you wrote it or not. Okay. So yeah. we already said, uh, uh, dream girl, you wrote. Yes. Pizza pie. You wrote. Yes. Tell me why. Uh, I wrote it along with Buzzy Hellfan. Okay. Rainy day bells. I didn't write. That's a Neil Sedaka song. Gotcha. Uh, dance girl dance. I wrote that. That's love. I wrote that. Tell me about the song Do Re Mi. I wrote that too. And you wrote um, that too. I I I I don't know what I'm trying to recall what the inspiration for Do Re Mi was. Um sometimes it it, it you, you don't get an inspiration from deep down in your bones. Sometimes mm -hmm. it comes from somewhere else. Sometimes it comes from rhythm. Sometimes it comes from doing a little dance or something. Well, Do Re Mi is a is a, a rhythm song, and um, it, it it's something that I felt that I would write because it's the or origin of music. And so, although it's not a sophisticated type of song in that respect, it is the origin the uh, origin of music. And so, I felt that I wanted to write something along those lines. And and I did, and that's how it started. Sure. Well, uh, no insult meant here, but Pizza Pie is not on the level of uh, "You'll Never Walk Alone" and "Man of La Mancha," but it does have a place <laughs> in our hearts and in and our our souls. Our, I love our, it. I yeah. love your analogy. It's just great. Thank you. Uh, that's love. I wrote that. Yes. Aggravation. I wrote that. <laughs> You want to know what you want to know what the inspiration for that was? I probably had an argu an argument with my wife, and so I came out of the argument, and I knew, that was my inspiration. And I wrote aggravation. <laughs> this is great. Now, uh, Lover Doll. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't that. able to. What? I wrote that too. You wrote that too. Yeah, Audrey. I didn't write Audrey. Audrey was written by uh, one of the guys in the group, uh, Andre Lilly, the second tenor. He had a girlfriend. He had a girlfriend named Audrey, and he wrote the song. Fabulous, fabulous. Uh, Lonely Boy, is was that the Paul Anker song? No. No, no. It's I wrote that song. No, I wrote it from scratch. Yeah, it's 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 different. It, it and I, and it gets mixed up with the Paul Anker song, but no, it's uh, I wrote that uh, as well. All right, I got two more for you. Uh, dearest, my dearest one. Uh, that was written by Buzzy Hellfan. For you. Yes. Right, and I wasn't able to find uh, this, but I don't think it's the same song as the Domino Sixty Minute Man. No, it's 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 the same song. It is and, the same song. Yeah, we recorded it. Our our bass, Leon McLean, uh, sang with them before he sang with us, and he did Sixty Minute Man, and so that was his song. But I don't know who wrote that song. I don't know who wrote Sixty Minute. Man. Wow, that you know, uh, I can name uh, ten people who made a long career that didn't write. 5% of what you did. That's amazing that you wrote all these songs. Thank you. That's very sweet of you. There's, there's, there's a, there's a, 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 a CD that somebody put out. The, there's so many more songs that I wrote that were never, that were never put out. You know, I, I don't even know what to say about it. Uh, I'm writing music now and I'm writing songs now. And I'm getting a thrill out of doing it. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's what I do. If you ask me what I do, that's what I do. Right. I do know that uh, when you do get together with uh, the current incarnation, you have a gentleman named Warren Tesoro with you, uh, yeah. who's probably, and I'm not saying this right now because he's on the, he's on watching the show, who's probably one of the greatest harmonizers that were never discovered. I agree with you. Warren Warren is, I don't even know how to describe him. First of all, he's one of the most delightful and delicious guys that you've ever met. He is a sweetheart. 
He has a wealth of knowledge because he worked at Colony Records for 30 years and he met everybody and he knows everybody and he loves the music down to his bones. Yep. He revolutionized, he was the best thing that happened to the Rob Roy's in, in many, many years when we got him. Wow. That's some compliment, and I hope he's still watching because uh, it's it's comments like that that make people feel appreciative. Uh, got a picture right now. A Anthony, put up picture number four. I want Norman to see this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you got a perfectly good bar stool there, and nobody's using it. Right. What, what, I, I must have been. It must have been the photographer who who set us up this way. I have no idea, really. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, we're going to just put up another couple of pictures before you ask another question. Anthony, picture number five. Oh no, skip that. We did that six. Okay, this of course. There's Warren right there. Right. Uh, this of course was from the PBS special. Correct. Uh, that was which one was that on? Uh, well, that was the one we did. We did tell me why on, and I'm right. not sure of, of which one it was. Um, but there were there were a number of people that were on that show. It was right. it was a great show, right? Uh, and then Anthony, number seven, please. Oh, those that's, that's, not, those, are, those are my California guys. Okay, so, so you have you have an East Coast and a West Coast Rob Roy's. And I probably have a Florida group that, that that performs with me too because these promoters don't want to pay for the groups to come to different places. So right. he sent me up with local people. But these guys are my buddies and uh, Charlie DeComo and Bill Frischman and Jan DeTana. And they're lovely guys. And they helped me a great deal when I moved out to California. They They took me in. And they made me feel comfortable. And there's one other guy that made me feel very comfortable. It's the late Wally Roker. And Wally, you know, he was just a wonderful, wonderful guy. He used to sing bass with the heartbeats. And um, he was he was part of our group out here, too. But we lost him a few years ago. Right, right. Uh, well, we're sorry about that. Uh, Anthony, put up picture number eight. Now, this was taken at the Tarrytown Music Hall. Outdoors, uh, outside. This is your New York-based Rob Roy's? Uh, uh, yes. Well, Warren, and on the right is Tino Alvarez. And then on uh, Bob Thera is in the middle. And then very much to the left is the bass that I told you, Leon McLean, yes. who was the guy who did 60-Minute Man. Right. Uh, I got to try to find a recording of that because that's one of my favorite uh, favorite songs. So uh, now the group, uh, right before the British invasion, you guys broke up in 63. Uh, did you continue to sing solo, Norman, or did you do any kind of projects? No, I got out, I got out of the music business. But you I went to work for Capitol Records. Yeah, I worked for Capitol Records, but I didn't last too long. Um, I was I was I had some wonderful experiences at Capitol Records. Um, I was in the studio when uh, when Nat King Cole made all his wonderful hit songs into stereo from Menorah, and I spent three three weeks to to a month with him. He was just the most wonderful man that you could ever imagine. He was a star of great magnitude and he wore his stardom so beautifully that I'll never forget him. I love Nat, he was just great. And in addition to that, um, we also recorded and we were in the studio when Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks did the 2000 year old man and they did many, many takes, and I had to bring my friends down in order to sit in the audience. They needed an audience. And so um, I met Mel Brooks. He was part of the Capitol Records group and very, very funny and, uh, and, and crazy 
and it was a great experience. And I was in the studio when Ray Charles recorded Georgia on my mind. Wow. It was part of it was part of the album The Genius Hits the Road. And it was the first album that he did for ABC Paramount when he left Atlantic Records. And I always wondered, they took them nine months to re release that song. And I couldn't get that song out of my head. It was just the most fabulous thing that I had ever seen, I had ever heard. And then I there were so many other great stars that I that that I had the experience of working with at Capitol. It was it was just one of the most fabulous times of my life. But then I, I had to go in, I went into the army, and, and from the army, my father passed away. And um, I, 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 when I came out, I had to do some serious thinking about making some money. And so I got into the clothing business and spent many, many years in the clothing business. And I traveled all over the world. And it was an unbelievable experience as well. So no matter what success you had with uh, the clothing industry, when the doo-wop revival doors came knocking, you were ready to get back out there. I'll tell you an interesting story. The first doo-wop revival show that I did was when Gus Gossett started it. He did a, a show for the Beekman Theater, but he did it at Hunter College Auditorium on the east side of Manhattan. And I originally didn't want to do the show because I had my business. I was taking a, a group of buyers on a fishing trip from Freeport, Long Island, which we did. And I had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And the show, there were two shows. It was Saturday night, and we were taking them out on a Sunday. But they convinced me, Bob Thera, the baritone in the group, convinced me to do the show and and we came down, and it was great. It was it was a great show, and um, I didn't realize how strong the revival movement would be until the intermission between the first and the second show. And I looked out on Sixty Eighth Street, and I saw people wall to wall, people, no traffic, you couldn't move. From Lexington Avenue to Park Avenue, the streets were packed with people. And the show was, the two shows were complete sellouts. And I was just, I, it blew my mind that it was such a great, great situation that, that I knew from there on in there was going to be revivals. And, uh, and that was just wonderful. Of course. And you know what else leads to those revivals, Norman, is all the artists, uh, from the 70s, 80s, and today, re-recording uh, the classic doo-wop only songs. Correct. Exactly you know, right. That's and, They were and, great. Uh, it was great music. Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, I'm made to understand that your son is not your only child with musical abilities. No, my, I, I, I meant to say that. My, I, I, I don't want to get any heat from my daughter she was also the first female artist signed to DreamWorks when they went into business. And she's a great, great talent. And she sings um, alternative rock music, has the most magnificent voice. As a matter of fact, um, I got her to sing a little bit on one of the songs that we did on one of the CDs that we've done. And uh, I'm going to get her to do more. I'm going back into the studio and I, I wanted to get her to do some more music with me. Well, we think that's a great idea, and we want to promote uh, your next uh, project, Norman, so you must stay in touch with us. Uh, for those of you out there who want to know more about Norman Fox and Rob, Rob Roy's, their new website uh, is going to be normanfoxandtherobroys.com. He's got a YouTube channel under Norman Fox Channel, and uh, we spoke about this before, Norman, and I think you should be writing down your memoirs to put into a book. That's what I think. I'm writing down my memoirs, and I really have – there's a lot to write. I have a lot that I want to write. But when I read it, it, 
it's not moving me. I want, I want it to move me. So I'm, I'm going to rewrite it. I'm not, I'm not finished with it yet. It's an ongoing work in progress. But I certainly will. I'm going to, I, I plan on doing it. My son wants me to do it. And he asked me to do it. I said, who's going to buy it? Who's interested in it? And he said, do it for me. And I said, okay. And I started doing it. And I want to get it to really pop. So I'll keep you posted. Yeah, please do. Yeah. But you know, Norman, we, we are our own worst critics. So uh, don't look at your writings that it doesn't pop and move you. Uh, make sure you have somebody that you respect read it and give you another uh, vision of it. I certainly will. That's a great idea. Thank you yeah. so much. We're always our worst critics. Uh, you know that. Uh, let me ask you something, Norman. Uh, and I don't want to put it like this, but but there's no way to say it. Other than not having more chart success, do you have any regret, regrets uh, that you haven't fulfilled yet? Is there a certain project or a certain song or something certain that if you were given another three wishes in life, what would be a wish that you could achieve at this point in your life? I want to I want to write music and I want to perform. I've put out a lot of home videos for my fans and my friends. My fans are my friends. And it's been so heartwarming for me to do that during this COVID-19 situation. I must have 13 or 14 home videos. They're not professional, but they're from my heart. And the notes that I get from people have let me know that they really, really appreciate that I do it and it makes them feel good and they look forward to hearing them. I want to entertain people. I want to write music as long as I have the strength to be able to do it. That's where I am right now. Right. That's what I want to do. Right. Uh, we think uh, that's a great, that's a great way to be. Uh, what, where is that channel? Uh, is that the Norman Fox channel where those videos can be seen? Yeah, I, I think so. I, if they go to my website, I can put up the exact, uh, YouTube uh, digits to where they can they can get to that channel. We just you know we're very lucky. I have so much stuff on YouTube. It's 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 endless, and and I don't want it to get mixed up with the latest videos. And because mm. of the algorithms, it it is. But I'm gonna put up if they go to my website, which is normanfoxandtherobroys.com. I'll put up. The, the exact places where they have to go to 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 get to that uh, to those videos. Right. They'll love them. They're great. Right. Uh, we have one of our viewers, Robin uh, Longabardi, who said you did a Valentine's video that had her in tears. Uh, what was that about? Well, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to do something for Valentine's Day, and and Karen suggested that I do something for Valentine's Day. And she was right. I mean, I thought that it was it was it was a great uh, vehicle. So I just fast in 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 a, in a a day or two. I thought about doing one of my favorite songs is um, is is by Lionel Richie. And um, if I could remember the song that I endless love and. Um, so I, I, I recorded it home in here at, in, in my house and I put it up I, and people are, people are writing in that it's bringing them to tears, which I, it just, it's just heartwarming for me. Well, we're going to have to go back and look at that and we're going to promote your website and your YouTube channel uh, to all of our viewers. Uh, and when you're ready to pro promote your next project, we are now in the Norman Fox corner. 
So we well, what, a, what a sweet thing to say. And, and, and what a wonderful interviewer you are. Um, you, really, you really have a way of bringing out what people want to say. You have a natural talent for it. And I'm very, very pleased that I did this interview. I, I am so honored that you agreed to it. Uh, with the time difference, thank you. Uh, if you are so inclined, if you want to write some nice words on the page so that other people uh, we're reaching out for know that these interviews, although I'm not Larry King and I'm not Jimmy Kimmel, I do this from my heart. And I love the music. I love you guys and girls for giving us the soundtrack of our lives, of my parents' lives. And uh, I don't know if your son Stephen is watching, but I don't know if you know, Norman, they took some of Elvis's records and added a symphony orchestra to them. And I think Dream Girl would make a wonderful symphonic song. So maybe Stephen would want to do that as a project. Well, it would be a wonderful thing. I'll certainly tell him. <laughs> wonderful. Norman, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's give a Bronxite, a true original, and a man with no airs about himself the biggest round of his applause. Mr. Norman Fox of Norman Fox and the Rob Roy's, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Gene. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'll call you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I, I I just want to know uh, to my viewers and my listeners, because now we are on all different platforms. We are on Spotify, Amazon, uh, Google, all different podcast platforms. Type in my name and you get all the shows that we've done. I want to know, are you guys having as much fun as I am? Go to my website, genedanapoli.com. Send me a message. Uh, go on Facebook, Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli. Let me know that you're enjoying this uh, because it, it makes me happy to know that we're keeping some music alive. We're giving you people who a lot of people don't know is still out there. Uh, I do wish I would have done this a year ago or two, a year or two ago because I would have had People like my dear friend Pepe Cardona from Alive and Kicking, Bobby Lewis, Tossing and Turning, uh, so many other people that we've lost in the past year or two, which had I had the foresight uh, to do this, I would have loved to have gotten them on the show. And you could support us by going to my YouTube channel, Gene DiNapoli, because we're going to be doing some shows that are not going to be on Facebook, only on YouTube. Join the Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli page. Go to our website, genedinapoli.com, and send us a note. Please support our guests in their CDs and their books. And also, let's go to our sponsor, Anthony. Once again, we are going to say thank you to our Cruise Planners Dream Destination Travel. That's sundrenchedcruises.com. Talk to Howard and Karen about your honeymoon, your anniversary, or any destination plan that you would like to take. Tell them that you saw their ad on the Gene DiNapoli show and get that bonus deposit money. If you book a cabin, they will match it at $250. If you book three cabins or more, they will match it for five hundred dollars. So uh, that's how we know uh, people are seeing the show. If you enjoyed it, please share it uh, through all your social media platforms. Um, once again, happy Valentine's Day to everybody! Thanks to my producer Anthony for doing such a wonderful job behind the scenes. And uh, next week, Anthony, put it up. Next week, we got the sax player. From Bill Haley and the Comets, Joey D'Ambrosio. Anthony, where's that banner? Put it up. Next week's show. Okay. Look at the songs, everybody. 
rock around the clock, shake, rattle, and roll. See you later, alligator. Dim, dim the lights, burn the candle. This guy, Bill Haley, 15 big hits, sax parts by Joey D. Ambrosio. So great. Uh, for those of you that are on the page, you'll notice we put up a couple of new shows. The end of March, we just got Bobby Rydell will be our guest. April 5th, Jay Siegel from The Tokens. Now, you want to talk about a song that took on another life after The Lion King. So as we do every week, ladies and gentlemen, stay safe, stay positive, stay healthy, and God bless you. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.